This message is entitled, Unity of the Race in Man's Original State, and it's given by Dr. Earl Rodmacher. This hour, Roman numeral two, I want to begin with the unity of the race. First, it was the origin of the race, the origin of man, now Roman numeral two, the unity of the race. That the race is descendant from one pair. And this won't take us long, just a few statements here, first from the testimony of science and then from the testimony of scripture. So capital A under Roman numeral two, the testimony of science, from four areas of science. First, the argument from history. I'm not going to try to defend any of these. I'm just going to state them as a synopsis of what the historian says, for example. Evidence in history points to a common origin and ancestry in Central Asia. When you put together the records of the migrations of man, they seem to indicate that there has been a distribution from a single center, historically. Okay, the argument from history. Secondly, the argument from language. Comparative philology, study of language, points to a common origin of the more important languages. So what history does in migrations of men from a common center in Asia, language does in a common origin for languages. Three, the argument from psychology. The souls of all men, with their inherent properties, are essentially the same. That is, all have the same instincts, the same passions, the same mental, moral characteristics, generally speaking. So, says the testimony of psychology. All have the same instincts, passions, mental and moral characteristics. Fourth, the argument from physiology. The common judgment of comparative physiologists is that the human race constitutes a single species. The same testimony comes from the sciences, whether it's from history or philology or psychology or physiology. The unanimous consensus is the unity of the race. Louis Burkhoff, in his Systematic Theology, page 189, makes this statement. Science does not positively assert that the human race descended from a single pair, but nevertheless demonstrates that this may have been the case and probably is. It is not dogmatically stated as such, but asserts that it may have been the case demonstrates that it may have been the case and that it probably is. What about the testimony of Scripture, capital B? One, under the testimony of Scripture, all share the same human nature. Genesis 3 and verse 20, And Adam called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. All share the same human nature the mother of all living. Genesis 1, 27 and 28 could be suggested at the same time, and you might compare 1 Corinthians 15, 47 to 49 to support the fact that all share the same human nature. Two, all share the responsibility for the first transgression and the need for salvation. In Romans chapter 5, passage to which we made reference before, verses 12 and 19, you have this truth. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, so death passed on all men, for all have sinned. Again in verse 19, for as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. The word of God makes it very, very clear that men are one in sin, the many in the one, and the one in the many. 
in a matter of sin. For by one sin of the one man Adam, we all sin. We were all in Adam in the sin. So all share responsibility for the first transgression and the need for salvation. Again, 1 Corinthians 15, 21 and 22 supports the same teaching. Thirdly, all share the same genetic and genealogical unity. And for a scripture there, Acts 17, 26. And he has made of one blood all nations of men to dwell on all the face of the earth. Those three factors from the testimony of scripture seem ample testimony to the unity of the race. The scripture teaches that the race is one. Now, Roman numeral three, man's original state. And under this, we would like to talk, first of all, about the original endowments of man and then his original nature. First of all, the original endowments of man. One, his actual state. A under that, environmentally. And here note Genesis 2.8. The place of his abode was ideal to meet his needs. The Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden. There he put the man whom he had formed. Out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life also in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. A river went out of Eden to water the garden. From thence it was parted, became four heads. The name of the first is Pishon, which is it which compasseth the whole land of Havilah, where there is gold. And the gold of that land is good. There's bdellium and the onyx stone. The name of the second river is Gihon. The same is it that compasseth the whole land of Cush. And the name of the third river is Hittichel. This is it which goeth toward the east of Assyria. The fourth river is Euphrates. The Lord God took the man and put him in a garden of Eden to fill and to keep it. The place of his abode was ideal to meet his needs. B, personally, his actual state, B, personally, and a series of things here. First of all, Adam, as he was created, was mature as to capacity, but not fully developed as to experience. And I want to relate again here to what I said earlier about the creation with age. He was not created embryonically. He was not created as an infant. He was created as an adult. I don't know what age an adult is, whether that's 30 or what it is. But he didn't have any age, yet he was a full adult, capable of carrying on mature adult relationships. But he didn't have any experience. So he was mature as to capacity, but not fully developed as to experience in his creation. Second in brackets, as to his personal, actual state, he enjoyed communion with God. Genesis 2.16, Genesis 3.18. Genesis 2.16, and the Lord God commanded the man, saying, the Lord spoke with man, he talked with man, communed with man. Chapter 3, verse 8, and they heard the voice of the Lord God. While they were walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. The Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice, and so on and so forth. So that man had the potential of communion with God. Not the potential, that's not correct. He did commune with God. Three, he was given a helper answering to his needs. Genesis 2.18 the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him an help fit for him. And verse 21, And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs, closed up the flesh thereof. The rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he to a woman and brought her unto the man. Someone has said he did not take a bone from the foot so that woman should be trampled upon by man, nor did he take a bone from 
the head that she should rule over him, but from the rib that she should be the closest thing to his heart. Isn't that sweet? And Adam said, This is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called, wow, <laughs> woman, because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. He was given a helper answering to his needs. Fourth, he had an aesthetic sense. Not an athletic sense. Aesthetic sense. A-E-S-T-H-E-T-I-C. Genesis 2.9. And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight. He had an aesthetic sense. As well as good for food, he also had an appetite. Fifth, he had reflective and creative intelligence and intuitive knowledge. Several things under that that illustrate it. For example, he could invent, understand, and use language symbols. Genesis 2.16 and 20. Verse 20, Adam gave names to all cattle and to the fowl of the air, to every beast of the field. You don't think that's inventive? You try naming them sometime. Again, he could look at the facts and draw correct conclusions from the same verse. Notice, as he looked at all the animals and named them all, he came to a conclusion. There was not found and help fit for him among all the animals. Third, he could use tools. Genesis 2.15. The Lord God took the man, put him into the Garden of Eden to till it and to keep it. He could use tools. Fourth, he could foresee consequences and take them into account before he experienced them. Genesis 2.17. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Without experiencing it, he was able to recognize the consequences. Fifth, he was able to see connections between ideas and reason out conclusions. Genesis 2, 23 and 24 again, this is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh, she shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. He could see connections between ideas and now the result or conclusion, therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. All right, so much for his actual state environmentally and personally. Number two, his moral nature. And we're going to seek to distinguish here between holiness of nature and holiness of character. Two different things, one natural and that other by experience. A, his actual moral nature. This is a little weighty here, so hang on and get the three pieces and I think you'll put it all together. Man's moral nature was not one of positive righteousness and holiness. Else he would have understood the choice or distinctions between good and evil. It was not positive righteousness and holiness. It was more passive. Secondly, he was not innocent. Else he would have been a moral non-entity, when in actuality he enjoyed active fellowship with God. We mentioned Genesis 3, 8, and following. Therefore, rather, he was in a condition of unconfirmed or untested holiness. Not positive holiness, but unconfirmed or untested holiness. Now, what do we mean by that? That is, he possessed the inherent tendency to do right, but with it was attached the freedom to choose evil. 
He possessed the inherent tendency to do right, but with it was attached the freedom to choose evil. And that condition that we've described was created by God and might be called a theoretical holiness of nature. Not a holiness of character, a holiness of nature. A creaturely, untested holiness. Not a positive righteousness, which is the result of experience, or an innocency because he wasn't tested yet. It wasn't innocency. It wasn't that he'd been tested and remained innocent. But rather it was an untested creaturely holiness. A theoretical holiness of nature. B. His possible moral nature. If the right choice were made, this would result in holiness of character. That is, the way he was created, with untested holiness. If the right choice were made, that would result in holiness of character. That is, the tendency to do right, which is the product of experience. Let me read that through again. If the right choice were made, this would result in holiness of character, which is the tendency to do right, namely the product of moral experience. A condition wherein man would make right choices in the face of moral test could not be created by God. Think that through. That could only come through probation. God could not make a creature who would have made the right choices through moral tests. That must come through experience. He created a creature who had a bent to do that which was right, who had the ability to also choose evil. Now, that kind of a creature needed to be submitted to tests. And that could only come through probation. Now, capital B, the original responsibility of man. We looked at the original endowments of man, capital A. Let's look at the original responsibility of man. What was he supposed to do? And this opens up the area to right down to the millennium. First, under the original responsibility of man, one... His assigned duties, dash, obedience to God's positive commission. Here was Adam's great commission. Twofold. A, in relation to the earth. Man was to subdue, rule, to name the animals, etc. He was to have dominion over them. He was to dress the garden, he was to keep it, he was to till it, he was to subject it unto him, he was to be God's vice regent on earth, ruling over the earth in submission to the sovereign God. Verses such as Genesis 1, 26 to 30. And the Lord God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image, in the image of God created he him, male and female created he them, and God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb-bearing seed which is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree in which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed. To you it shall be for food, and so on and so forth. So he was to rule the earth. He was to subject the earth. I take it that must mean that the entirety of the earth was not Eden. Eden was a garden in the earth, and Adam was put in that garden. Now he was to subject the entirety of the earth, to till the whole of it. He was to bring the whole thing into subjection to himself, in subjection to God. Genesis 1, 26 to 30, Genesis 3, 17 to 19, Genesis 9, 1 to 7, Psalm 8, 4 to 8, 
Romans 8, 18 to 22, Hebrews 2, 5 to 8, James 3, 7. You notice some of those passages relate to that which is yet to happen to this earth that has been postponed as a result of the fall. Romans 8, this creation groaneth and travaileth, waiting for its what? Waiting for its redemption. The creation groans. All right, B, under his assigned duties, in relation to the family, he was to marry and procreate. Genesis 1, 28, A. God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. And I take it it was going to be through the process of multiplying that they would have dominion over the earth. It wasn't that Adam was going to rule over the whole earth there, but it was through multiplication that Adam would rule over the earth. And I take it that if man had not sinned, that Adam and Eve would not have had the necessity to procreate so much. If man would have been confirmed in righteousness and man had not died, then you would not need to beget so many people to complete the job of subjecting the earth. But that isn't the way it happened, and there's no use dealing in hypothesis. The fact is, he must procreate ferociously, apparently, to keep replenishing the source. And with some, that's more ferocious than others. I remember when we went to the hospital with our third child, they gave us a dirty look, as though we'd done something inherently evil. And with the fourth, it was unforgivable. I don't know what we do with those of you who have six and seven, if you do. He was in relation to his family to marry and procreate, as I take it part of the methodology of subjecting the earth. Now, too, under his original responsibility, is his moral responsibility. His moral responsibility, dash, obedience to God's prohibition. Now let's try to get this really straight, because it sure is botched up often. The Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. You remember back in the preceding passage, God had given them the fish of the sea and the fowl of the air and every living thing that moveth upon the earth. I've given you the herb bearing seed, which is upon all the face of the earth and every tree and which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed. To you it shall be for food and to every beast of the earth and to every fowl of the air and to everything that creepeth upon the earth wherein there is life. I have given every green herb for food, and it was so, and so on, and so forth. Now, God gave man a lot. Now, man had a responsibility, he had a test. And God said, of one particular tree, don't take of it. Now, that was not a temptation for Adam, that was a probation. And there's a difference. While there is a distinction to be made between the two, temptation and probation, it is not necessarily at the level of the material object. The, the object remains the same, the tree. In this case, was the same thing. The difference lies in the source, the difference between probation and temptation. God says, let no man say when he is tempted, he is tempted with God. For God does not tempt men with evil. Satan was at the heart of the temptation. Satan used the point of testing as a temptation. God was using the point of testing as a probation. The motivation of God was good. The motivation of Satan was evil. On the case of God, the intention was for strengthening and establishment. In the case of Satan, the Motivation and the temptation was for fall and degradation. The motivation behind it is entirely different. Man was not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, God is not forbidding man here the knowledge of good and evil. 
but rather he is establishing the proper way to attain it. God is not forbidding man good and evil. And oftentimes it's presented like he is. You know, God didn't want man to know. Well, that's not it at all. God built into man the drive to know. God is not keeping man from the knowledge of good and evil, but rather he is establishing the proper way to attain it. And that may seem to be very insignificant. Well, it's the strongest of prohibitions, the very strongest of prohibitions. And it actually stands for a much larger truth, which is the truth of obedience. That's the whole issue. The issue was not what kind of a tree it was or what kind of fruit it had on it, or nor was the fruit some kind of a magical fruit that if you took a bite, lo and behold, something would happen, like that little naked girl that advertises cranapple juice on the TV. This is not the point of it. It stands for the larger truth of obedience, or lack of such to the expressed will of God. God's test was in relation to obedience. Resist the temptation, and thus gain knowledge. Who knows more about testing today, the God-man Jesus Christ, or we? Jesus Christ. Why? Because when he went the test, he went the whole way, 100%, without falling. So he understands the full pressure of it. All of us fell somewhat short of that. So we have never known the full pressure of testing. He knew the full pressure of testing. God's test was in relation to obedience. Resist the temptation and thus gain knowledge. Satan's suggestion was resist God's will and thus gain the knowledge the wrong way. It was not the material thing of the tree that was at issue. It was a larger test of obedience. God will often do that. We have people today that get all uptight about the fact, you know, just one little thing. Poor Adam. Just one thing he did. And God blamed the whole race for it. And the whole race fell because of one little thing that Adam did. That's negative thinking. See, why didn't they think the other way and say, you know, God gave man everything that he could desire, aesthetically and every other way. And he said, of all of these things, you may freely eat. There's everything that you could want. Just don't touch this. Don't, don't eat. I got the devil's words there. Those weren't God's words. It was the devil that said, don't touch it. God said, don't eat of it. He said, don't eat of it. Just one thing. Why? Because there had to be one thing at least in order to have a test. And that was probation. And man blew it on the one thing, even though he had the whole garden. So don't make God out to be a skin flint. God gave him more than heart could desire. Now, the beautiful thing about that is though God tested man, and man failed the original test, God's purpose has not failed. And God will yet complete that purpose. The place where the battle was begun, earth, will be the place where the victory is won, earth. And all of that long, arduous course of history that becomes between the time of the sin and the time of the culmination of God's purpose is that time in which God is now working out the victory. And the victory is twofold, and this most people miss. Most people run through the Bible, and they talk about the scarlet thread that runs through the Word of God, the redemption line, and that God is saving people. Well, now we can all rejoice in the fact that God is saving people. But I want to suggest to you that that cannot possibly explain the long, arduous course of history. If God's singular purpose was to save man, then why in the world didn't he create him, permit the fall, provide salvation, allow belief, and take him out of this world and have it over with? Why the long thousands of years of history? What is God doing? Well, the fact is, God is doing something more than saving man. God is reclaiming his kingdom 
and thereby demonstrating that he shall have the victory because he alone is God. And that's why this little microscopic speck of dust called earth has become the focal point for the incarnation of the Son of God. Because earth and what happens here is to be the vivid demonstration to all created intelligence for all eternity that God alone is God. And that which Satan sought to do when he injected his temptation on man because of his prior sin and thereby set up a kingdom of darkness contrary to the kingdom of God will one day be done away at the culmination of history. So mankind was God's apex of creation. In the days of creation, he was the epitome of creation. He was to be God's vice regent, and he was to rule on the earth, and he was to subject all of this, and he was to demonstrate to the kingdom of darkness that God alone is God, and Adam failed in that. And God knew that failure would be forthcoming, and that there would be the need for the providing of a redeemer. And that one who would redeem man would also reclaim the earth to the sovereignty of God. So that when you go back to Genesis 3.15, and you have the battle that starts between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent, there is a twofold thrust that Jesus is going to be Savior to redeem man, and he's going to be sovereign to reclaim the earth. You move all the way through the prophets, and that twofold strand goes all the way through. God's going to do something on the earth, and God's going to do something in man. Earth and man, earth and man. You come over to Matthew chapter 1, and when you have the genealogy, it talks of Jesus Christ, son of David, son of Abraham. Why those two? Abraham, in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. Spiritual posterity. Savior, Redeemer. Son of David, why that? David, the King. Jesus Christ, the greater Son of David, who shall rule yet on the earth. Twofold strand. Son of David, Son of Abraham. Sovereign, Savior. Reclaiming the earth, redeeming man. Or you get over to Revelation chapter 5, and you have what? Jesus pictured as the Lion of the tribe of Judah and the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. As the Lamb, he's the Savior, the Redeemer of man. As the Lion of the tribe of Judah, he is the Sovereign King who shall rule victoriously on the earth. So what are we waiting for? We're waiting for the millennium. And God is going to win the victory in the same place where the battle was started. And the millennium, therefore, will become the greatest ecological revolution that has ever taken place this side of the flood, if not this side of the fall. In the millennium, government shall be reconstituted. And Jesus Christ, the second Adam, the benevolent dictator, shall rule in the only successful government that the earth has ever had. There shall be righteousness and justice and equity at the moment. Man's nature shall be changed so that man is said to be a hundred years old and be a baby. I take it there shall be no death in the millennium from natural causes. Man shall live on and on. The entirety of nature shall be changed. The animal world shall be changed. The lamb and the lion shall lie down together. The little child shall lead them. They shall no longer be carnivorous beasts. They shall eat straw. The one who sows shall be followed immediately by the one who reaps. There shall be harvest all year long. The millennium will be the grand climax to God's anthropology. And it shall be done through the God-man, Jesus Christ. God is not going to close out this world's history in defeat. God is going to close out this world's history in tremendous triumph so that for a thousand years Jesus Christ shall reign on the earth as the second Adam 
who will accomplish what the first Adam failed to do. And when he has subjected all things unto him, and the last enemy that he shall subject shall be death, and when he has subjected even death, then what shall he do? He shall turn the kingdom over to God the Father, for this earth will have had its grand display in history. It shall have fulfilled its purpose, and God shall be honored as the only God for all eternity. That's a summary of the doctrine of man from beginning to end.